the four organizations. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us on one of the 16 stations that is broadcasting our program here in 2020, through a radio app, through your web, through our website, not your website, our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com on the season four tab at the top of the page in studio video replay or podcast replay. We thank you for that. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, maintaining your landscape, make your trees look greener and your grass look healthier. We're here to help you do that. You can get a hold of us in a couple of ways. One being you can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can send, uh, you can give us a call right now, 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. If we can't get to you, we will answer your question and then we will uh, we'll call you back if we can't get you on the program right now. 1-800-927-SHOW. We've got a program lined up for you that is worthy to be listened to, as all of our programs are. Uh, first segment is Growing Great Garlic. And the second segment, we're going to talk about tree problems and how to deal with them, identifying them and how to deal with them. And then we have terrarian expert Maria Collette will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So, Holly, let's get into the program here. And talk about growing great garlic. Now, this segment is sponsored by Big Elk Garlic Farm dot com out of Pennsylvania. Uh, specialty or it's a family owned and operated garlic farm, 100% GMO free. And we're happy to have them on board of the program. So garlic, Holly, it's kind of your, your specialty here. You have a, you kind of like growing garlic. It's my specialty. I didn't know that, but that's okay. So as I always say, garlic is stupid, easy to grow. And Joey and I didn't know that until, I don't know, we failed probably three years in a row. Um, But the first thing you want to know is you want to know what kind of variety you're growing. So there's hard neck garlic and there's soft neck garlic. And hard neck garlic is, um, it has a hard neck. It has a stem that grows through the bulb. The bulb, yeah. Um, and it gets, it's the one that gets the scapes and then soft neck does not have that stem and it does not get the scapes. So, um, and soft neck technically will store longer than hard neck, but, um, yeah. So you want to make sure you're choosing hard neck or soft neck and know what you're going to be growing. And if you're growing both varieties and you want to make sure you block off or whatever your different indicate which different two varieties you're growing. Um, so once you determine that, then you want to make sure you're going to, you're going to find a spot that you're going to grow this garlic and it's going to be there for at least nine months. Real estate used up. And, uh, whenever we built our raised beds this year in the garden, you can follow that on our YouTube channel, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, same name. Um, we decided that we weren't going to designate a bed specifically for garlic. We were going to put that in the ground because we find it has grown phenomenal out of the, let's, I think it's 10 years we've grown garlic. Out of the 10 years, we've had nine massively successful harvests. So we put, we're going to put it in the ground. So you don't nec- you don't have to grow it in a raised bed, uh, though you can. It's not recommended necessarily for a container because the elevation and the uh, exposure to the air, the, bl- it'll bl- freeze into a block of soil, uh, just an but ice cube. Could, it, it can be done. You could do like a small raised bed. Really easily put together if you want to do oh, yeah. garlic, yeah. Uh, so a couple of pallets fun. thrown together. We've got some videos on how to make pallet raised beds. So it's very easy to do such. Um, yeah, you've talked about the hard neck and the soft neck. Oh, uh, and 
you know, it, it doesn't really necessarily have to be the most loose, fluffiest soil in the world. It will grow in pretty uh, decently you, hard packed soil. You ideally soil. want to have loose, fertile soil, but right. if you don't, you don't. And that's okay for garlic, for some vegetables, whatever. It's, it's, it's deadly. Yeah, it's not okay. But garlic is, again, stupid easy to grow. So that's one thing. You want to plant it about a month before your last average frost date. So for us, we plant ours the the first week in, in October. October. Now, um, it, it's a guess now. It's not like there's no hard, oh, we're going to do it here. No hard uh, definition of, of the, but we want sometimes, to we, we explain the reason why we want to get it in before that ground freezes solid. Well, you want it so it gets established. Right. Essentially. So some people might feel that they're not going to plant it until November because we always get like those. There's like nothing a, wrong with that. Yeah. yeah. But we so, want to get it in the ground to get those roots established. And, and when we plant it in October, that first week in October, we still have warm temperatures. The soil is still warm. Uh, by the time the ground freezes, we have, in some instances, the garlic has got two or three inches of top growth on it. And that's fine, too. That's not going to hurt. It's not going to kill the plant. Now, it's whenever you plant it in, Oct- in July and your plant's you know 18 inches tall, that's when you've got problems. That's why we want to wait until fall or the coolest portion of the particular geographical area that you are in. I know we have people listening in you know, Tampa, Florida, so which is, is difficult and all that, but uh, northern here, about a month before the ground freezes. This is something you definitely want to figure out um, about a month before the last average frost date. And if you can grow garlic in your area, like you said, Joe had mentioned Florida. Um, so then you want to go through, and if you're if you're if you saved your garlic from last year or this this, this, or past, this year, yeah, yeah um, you want to use the biggest cloves. So. If you find the biggest bulbs, that's typically going to be the biggest cloves for you. So you can you can do that. You just want to make sure you're choosing the biggest cloves. Um, and then you want to space the garlic about 10 inches apart. Mm-hmm. In a row. In a row. And then row to row about a foot apart. About a foot apart. Now, when you say the largest cloves in the bulb, it's based on the variety. There are some varieties that only have six cloves and three of the six is extremely large. There's other varieties that have 15 cloves, and they're all very small because that's the type of garlic that it is. So if you want giant garlic, then you want to look in to see what type of garlic is best uh, that, that produces those large cloves. And I guess we should put the disclaimer in here that elephant garlic is not really garlic. No, it's related to leeks. An elephant garlic is related to leeks. So it's not true garlic. Um, so that's something that you definitely want to keep in mind. So that being said... It still has the garlic flavor. It still has the garlic it's flavor. It's easy to peel. It's easy to peal, but it's it's not true garlic. Right. It's grown In differently. The, yeah, yeah. So it's a, a season one, like one. Season. It's grown like regular onions. Right. It's not an overwintered thing uh, from the northern portions of the United States. So. So your plants will sprout, and that's okay. They should sprout. So they're going to sprout. You're going to see some growth, and that's okay. It's not going to once it freezes. Your plant's not going to. <clears throat> Excuse me, die. It's okay. Well, before we put them in the ground, we want to <clears throat> we want to take the cloves out of the bulb, the largest cloves. We do not want to peel the skin like you're going to prep it for a meal. We want to leave that skin on, and then we want to pre-soak it. You can do it in a, in, a, in a Dr. Jim's. You can do it in a Neptune's Harvest. You can do it in a compost tea. You can do it in water. What the process is there, it's hydrating the inner portions of that bulb, if you break apart your bulbs in now, in August, uh, and you let them set there for a month, they're going to dry up. They're going to shrivel to a certain degree. You want to keep that all intact so you only break it apart about 48 hours before you're really intending to plant it. And the, and the last 24 hours, you're going to pre-soak it so you can keep that clove as intact and as healthy and as hydrated as possible before it goes in the ground. And we're planting these about three inches in the ground. If you're in a raised bed, you can go four. It's not a big deal. Three is really a safe number uh, in depth in order to plant the, the garlic that you're going to grow. Right, right. So, yeah, you want to plant it like a, a teardrop. It looks like a teardrop. You want to plant it so the larger part is at the bottom and the point is towards the top. Well, let's talk about watering. We don't need to fertilize or we don't, and we do not need to water in the fall. Simply being, we do not want to activate these plants in order to grow. We want them to get established. Yes, you put them in the ground, it's going to rain, you're going to water the, the plants a little bit in order to get the roots and the hydration of the pre-soaking will allow the roots to start developing, to grasp hold of the soil, to start sucking up some nutrients. 
and then it will go into that dormant stage. Then you just let her sit there. Don't do a thing. You can walk away. Don't have to. Well, here's the other thing. Some people will cover their garlic. We've never covered garlic ever. No, some people will put um, some straw, even leaves, what have you, a thin layer. But we've never covered ours, but you certainly can. You just want to do a thin layer. You don't need to pound. You don't need to put like, you know, um, mound up. 18 inches of mulch you if you did it if you want if you feel the need to do so you can just do a thin layer but we don't when we we've had some of the coldest winters on record without any cover on our garlic and has done great the reason why garlic is planted in i mean you can plant we're not going to talk about it but it can be planted in the spring and harvested in the fall but the reason why you plant the garlic in the fall and harvest in the spring is because it needs a certain a number of cold hours in order to properly develop those cloves inside of that bulb and up here in the northern areas there are people that grow soft neck and do it very well but really the hard neck is the key is the best uh variety that the best of the two to grow in the northern climates and you get the scapes on it like you talked about earlier so now let's we've planted our garlic a month before it freezes, it started to come up. It's went into dormancy. Now it's springtime. What do we do? We we and we either covered it or we didn't cover it. So what do we do now? Well, you can certainly um, you can certainly mulch around it if you haven't. Now that it's spring, to help suppress any weeds that might come up. Um, so you can do that. You want to weed around the garlic carefully. You can side dress it with fertilizer or like a compost, what have you. A lot of people will do that. If it needs water, certainly water around here. We don't need water during spring. Um, and then for us, come like, I don't know what, early, early June? Early, well, yeah, late, June, late May, early June, depending on the, the year. We get the scapes. Right. And so this is for the hard nut garlic. And what a scape looks like is it's like a curly Q at the top and then near, like it's a growth with a curly Q and then it has like this little bump on it. Coming right out of the center stem of the plant. It goes up and then it does a, like a curly, like a swirly straw. Mm -hmm. And then that's the time you want to harvest it. And if you do not harvest it, your garlic bulbs will be somewhat smaller than if they weren't, if the, the escape was harvested because energy is being utilized and stored in the bulb, and then it's uptook, up to the stem to produce the scape, which is the seed, true seeds of the plant. So that's why we cut that scape off. And what can we do with a scape or scapes? Some people have hundreds of them. Some people have a few. You can do anything from chopping them up, adding them to stir fry, just grilling them as is. You can turn them into like a pesto. There's a lot of options for scapes. And if you make um, uh, garlic pesto, uh, garlic scape pesto, you've got a lot, gar- got to like garlic a lot because it is, it's, it's strong garlic. Now, when we grow garlic and we give it away or we use it, um, well, we harvest it here in late June, or in, about two to four weeks after we harvest the scape. Let's, let's get back so we're not confusing people. We harvest it about two to four weeks after the scapes have been removed. You'll know when it's time to harvest your garlic because the lower sets of leaves begin to die off. You do not have to wait for the whole plant to die off. You really want to harvest it as those lower leaves are beginning to die off because if you keep it in the ground too long, it, it could it could mold. It could you're um, going to get a bunch of rain. Yeah, you, you, you could, could lose it. You could get it to like um, break down. Be yeah, basically, or even an animal could get to it. So you want to harvest it. I get the idea of leaving it in a little bit longer, but you want to harvest it as soon as you can because you've put in this time and and space and effort. Nine so, months worth of time. Right. So you want to make sure you get it when it's it's the best. And when you harvest it, you want to use a fork or a shovel to loosen the soil around you around it. You don't want to just like yank it out. Because you're going to pull <laughs> the stalk out of the bulb and it's important to keep it intact with the hard neck and uh, hard neck garlic. Now the soft neck garlic will fall over like a springtime or like a like a summer onion. That's when you know it's ready to harvest. Hard neck garlic, it will. Uh, you want to leave everything intact. It's going to be tall. It's going to be firm. It's going to be a thick stalk, and hopefully you've got a very large, dense bulb that you're going to be extricating out of the soil with a shovel or a garden fork. You want to keep all of it intact and you can, you can either hang it or put it in like buckets or, uh, containers and keep it in an, a, um, vented 
indirect or a vintage shaded area for the curing process. And the curing process, based on if you're using in a side room or in a basement or a garage, can take a couple of weeks. Now, what the curing process is occurring, you can use the garlic right away. Not a problem. What the curing process occurring is it's you hang it vertical, and the gravity is pulling the juices out of the stalk back into the bulb. And then that allows you to keep a lo- get a longer shelf life on it. And then once the plant is completely dry, you can uh, snap the or cut the stalk off and leave about an inch or two above the bulb, however you want to do it. Some people will braid them. Uh, we, just, we don't braid them. We just cut the, the stem off of it. But the cure, how, it can take, what, le- le- about six months or so? It's really the pure good time to use it. Yeah, about six months you can... We've had some that's, you know, 14 months, but as it gets, it rapidly declines and gets smaller in the clove and starts drying up. And if you have a lot of garlic left over at the time of harvest next spring, go ahead and take and grind it up into whatever, grind it up into a... a, a uh, like a powder. A powder. Mm-hmm. It's going to be moist. And then you can put it and dehydrate it and turn it into garlic powder. Right. Or like garlic chunks or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So that's just a great way to grow, an easy way to grow garlic, sponsored by Big Elk Garlic Farm up in Pennsylvania, BigElkGarlicFarm.com. Uh, go there, check them out, uh, get your garlic for this fall's planting. And uh, once you buy the garlic, you never have to buy it again. You can continue to regrow and regrow and regrow. Right. Uh, it's not it's not a one and done thing. It's if done right, and you can uh, it, it works very well. You can go to our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, or our YouTube channel, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and type in "growing garlic." The, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener growing garlic, and we've got a great number of very uh, tutorial based videos on how you can do it successful in your garden. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 26th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about amending your soil and overwintering your vegetables. We also had author Ben Cohen on. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we'll make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and in the subject line, put show 25, and we will send you the link. We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about tree diseases. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that Kim fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jims will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. 
Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You got a couple of trees in the yard, maybe they're across the street, and you see that something's not looking very good on them. We're going to talk about some tree, common tree diseases and problems, and what you may be able to do once identifying those uh, diseases or problems have come to be. So let's talk about one of the more common ones that many people have heard of or maybe experienced, which is emerald ash borer. Yep. So the EAB or emerald ash borer is a, um, it bores into ash trees. And actually there's a few different, um, insects or whatever that bore into trees, but this is the most common known one because it's an invasive species. And if you have a tree that is susceptible to maybe it's a more, I think, what is it? Like a softer wood. Yeah. Um, you may want you may want to watch for that. So there there are ways to take care of it if, or, or to treat it if it if if uh, caught early enough. The, and then once there's kind of a turning point, once it gets to a certain point, they're, they're unsavable. Right. So um, so yeah, you want to prune back any branches that have been possibly infested, or yeah, and you can remove up to twenty five percent of the tree's uh, foliage. Um, so then the other thing is, is that if the infestation is in the trunk of the tree, you would call an arborist and then they can. Now, evaluate. now hold on. When you say arborist, not Jimmy, Bobby, Jim Bob, that's got a truck that, that comes one day and never returns again. Right. Certified, certified arborist. arborist. Yeah. That's right. Right. Just want- because Jim Bob only charges you a 25 and a nickel. There's a reason why it's cheap because he doesn't come back and he does a poor job at it. You want somebody that knows what they're doing because the, 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 the goal of this is to treat the tree. Trees are very valuable to your property, whether you're living there forever or you intend to sell the property. Uh, there's a lot of value in a very old tree. And if we can save that tree and get an extra five or 10 years out of it, it makes a very big difference. Right. So, yeah, so you'd call an arborist or um, you can also prevent in- infestations um, by keeping your trees healthy. So if you hear about an outbreak in your area, then you might want to spray the tree. Some people will uh, tent the tree or um, what's it called? Um, put a net around it. Okay. That's the thing. So if you if you find out that there's um, emerald ash borer damage in your area, it could it, you could try to prevent it. All right. Uh, let's see. What else can we... Tar spots. Maple trees. Yeah. So tar Pe- spots... Yeah. Explain what they are. Um, it's on maple and, and sycamore trees, actually. And okay. it's not like tar on the leaves. It's like these little black... You look at this, the leaf and you'll see a black dot. It's usually kind of in the center of the leaf. And what this is, it's a fungal disease, but it's not harmful to the tree. It's not harmful to you. It's not harmful to the soil around your tree. It's not harmful to anything. Bringing it... And we get this question... Uh, a lot whenever we, it's in the fall time, my tree has the maple spot on it. Is it okay to put in the garden for mulch? And it, it is totally okay because that disease is not uh, relatable to the plants or the soil that's in your garden. So it's totally okay to mulch it or just put them in as full leaves and utilize that as mulch. So there's not, there's not uh, any problem with that. Right. So, yeah, so there's no problem. You'll see this up here usually in like late spring or early summer. 
if you've never had it on a maple tree or a sycamore tree. Good for you. Good for you. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not a problem. Um, so another problem is compacted soil. Not necessarily a tree problem, but it could be a problem, like a, not a disease or whatever, but an uh, underlying condition. It's an underlying condition. So it's, um, it's, what happens is that we, we, most people, if you have a tree, you might be hanging out underneath that tree, compacting the soil, especially if that tree is younger. Using large uh, equipment to mow around the tree. To mow around the tree, yeah. Uh, and then you've got the roots that are starting to pierce out. Or what other people, and then, then some people will go, okay, well, we'll fix this problem. I'll just mulch around the tree. And then they put four cubic yards of mulch around a tree and, and make it go up the stem three foot, which is volcanic mulching or, or volcanic mulch. And that, uh, is detrimental to the tree almost, if not more than the compaction of the soil because that mulch gets moist around the bark of the tree. Your mulch should be two or three inches. And that's it. It shouldn't go up the tree. What happens is the fibrous roots start girdling around the big roots and choke them out because it's growing into the mulch. And then the mulch gets wet and then you get rodents and then the mold and fungal problems occur in the bark as up the, up the uh, trunk where mulch shouldn't be. And then you've got a terrible problem that you're dealing with uh, in addition to what other problems you may already be trying to combat. You're pretty passionate about that mulching. Well, there's municipalities of people who have gone to school to do this, and they do it wrong every single time. Big cities, uh, par- parks have, you know, ruined trees. Business parks. Yeah. Uh, landscape companies. So anyway, okay, so if you have... If you now feel back you to have, the tree problem. Now back to the tree problem. If you feel you have soil compaction, um, sometimes this also occurs with newer houses, too, because... They just are, a lot of these newer houses are built quickly, and top soils top removed. So, yeah. They've had all kinds of equipment come in uh, from concrete trucks to backhoes and everything else, and just has you know smushed the soil to no end. And they've already scraped all the good stuff off anyway, off of it anyway. So that that is also a problem uh, as well. Right. So um, what you can do is you can try to loosen the soil to reduce compaction. So you can take like a fork or something and go out there around the base of the tree and kind of loosen the soil gently. But you can also do what's called vertical mulching. You know what vertical mulching okay. is? Okay, sure. What, okay. what is vertical mulching? So vertical mulching? mulching is when you take something like an auger, like the power plant or uh-huh. auger, and you drill holes into the soil around the tree. Not in the roots. Not, or in not the roots. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's going to be, you're going to nick something. But yeah. most, you know, that's what we want to do is we want to kind of like aerate, like you aerate the yard with an aerator. You're doing the same around the, the but tree. But you're going to add in some sort of porous material. Right. Whether that be compost, but that way you're not disturbing the the soil that's there mm-hmm. too much. You're just adding some nice porous material to help kind of loosen that compaction. Well, also, if you've got a couple of, you know, a half a yard of compost and you put it around a tree a couple of inches uh, around the base of the tree and just let her set for six months, it's amazing how much nature brings that, co- takes that compost down and aerates the soil all by itself with microorganisms and worms and the rain. It does a really neat thing all by itself. So, you you know, it takes all the work out of it for you. You just need to stay off of it. Right. Yep. Well, so. let's go with the Dutch elm disease. There's another problem that uh, some of you are probably facing right now, and you're looking at a tree in your yard that has it. All right. Yep. So this is called, called it's a fungal disease, but it's the, these bark beetles spread it. So they spread it through inside the tree. They spread it inside the roots of the tree. They spread it everywhere. Well, this is also whenever you see those public service announcements, do not bring firewood, you know, don't carry firewood from your, you know, all this stuff. This is the reason why. Right. That's why. It's, it's, same thing with it's like just the, like whenever you cough on somebody, they get whatever you've got and they cough on It's the same thing. You're, you're spider webbing it out. So keep it, you know, where it's at. Right. So, yeah, so that's one thing. And then one, so what, once these bark beetles carry it around, it gets into the vascular system of the tree, which is what carries the water through the tree. And then that disease continues to move around. So you want to make sure that you're looking for problems. Um, if you have, if you think your, your tree has this problem, you want to remove any branches that would be infected. Well, and we want to also look at a certified arborist as well. Yeah. Because, yeah, there's great things on the Internet, and you can call people uh, you know, out and go, oh, that's what it looks. 
it it it's a very very good investment to get a professional's opinion because if you do this wrong, your tree is dead. And if you don't do anything, your tree is probably dead too. So you want to make the right moves and do them correctly. A little investment goes a long way when it comes to tree maintenance. Right. So definitely consider an arborist. Um, and there's a lot of great ones out there. Yeah, for sure. What else we have here? Yeah, so Dutch elm disease is, is spread through the the roots and then the vascular system. And you can purchase... If you want to plant a tree, you can purchase um, resistant cultivars of that okay. elm tree, but it's not guaranteed. But you can it, get, it gives you a better chance, right? And then, um, yeah. So you basically, if you if you feel you have a problem with a tree, you want to definitely reach out to an arborist or a tree service. They you will have the information that you need and they can take a look. Now I do know, and, and you can take this for face value or you can do your research. If you've got a tree that's got Dutch elm disease or emerald ash borer and it's dead, you can do two things to, to eliminate that disease in that wood. Burn the wood or shred it up. When you shred it up, it kills and breaks apart and, and there's no more of the, the, the problem. If you burn it, it disappears and no more of the problem. So those are two ways to eliminate if the tree is already dead uh, to get rid of the problem to try to prevent it from spreading to other trees of like variety on your property. Well, Holly, summer is getting close to being over, and the kids are doing virtual learning now in most cases. The nights are getting longer, and soon it'll be getting colder, and before long we'll have snow on the ground here, but we won't talk about that. And you've probably forgotten about your yard. Have you forgotten about your yard? You shouldn't forget about your yard. Your Your yard loves you. Yeah, your yard does love you. And just because it's almost fall, we don't want to forget about our our yards. And those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone. I don't know if they're gone. But they're not far, and they're not... They're always around lurking. Um, but they feast on your roses and berries this summer. They laid eggs in your turf so they can start again next year. So you want to take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scarab pests and their lar- larvae. Simply apply the granule with a spreader to irrigate it in the soil and natu- let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone the easy to use, but is the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls grubs and other and the, and and the favorite part of this Holly it is non-toxic to bees and other pollinators so you don't have to worry about them picking up taking back to their hive and and killing the hive off in fact grub gone has no label restrictions for using around flowers plants so you do not have to get on your hands and knees and remove dandelions or other unwanted weeds that have flowers to protect the bees. You can find all this and a whole lot more information out for Grub Gone. Just go to phylumbioproducts.com. It's the natural choice. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's all about terrariums. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardeners are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. At Big Elk Garlic Farm, they are passionate about their garlic and take great care to provide you with the best seed stock around. Their high-quality garlic is non-GMO. They stand behind their product 100%. Get your garlic for this fall's planting at BigElkGarlicFarm.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. 
The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. So you look out in your backyard and think, there's something that we can do here. We can fancy this up a little bit so we can enjoy our backyard. Well, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center can do that for you. Landscaping is in their name. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. You can visit them online at bluemills.com. You can go in person at 3940 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. They will take your vision and make it a reality so you can entertain and enjoy your backyard for years to come. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Landscaping, it's what they do. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest this week. Maria Coletti is a teacher um, at Westchester Community College in their adult education, or native plant curriculum, and she teaches native moss identification and creates an indoor moss solarium. She's a horticulturist, terrarium designer, traveling workshop instructor, and author. Her book is called Terrariums, Gardens Under the Glass, and her website is green-terrariums.company.site. Welcome to the program, Maria. Yes, hello. Hello. Glad to be here. Well, we are excited to uh, have you on the program. Uh, since we've booked you for the program, all I've heard from Holly is, I want to build a terrarium. I want to build a terrarium. So, <laughs> yes, you must. <laughs> so what is a terrarium for people who have heard the term but not familiar with it, and how did you get into creating these things? Sure, sure. Well, terrariums, even to this day, are like a magical uh, little glass house to me. Um, they are... Uh, a glass house usually made out of glass, and it's usually closed. That's your traditional terrarium, your classic terrarium, how they started. And what happens inside is that the plants are planted. They're, they have moisture in the soil, and they are closed in there. And then uh, this little self-sustaining ecosystem starts where the water evap- uh evaporates, kind of uh, rises up out of the soil and the leaves, and it, it gathers on the top and the glass, and as it accumulates, it then feeds back into the soil. And so it's this self-sustaining circular motion, and that's actually how the world and our planet work. Um, as the uh, everything rises into the sky, creates water and clouds, and then comes back down and sustains us. So the mystery is just so wonderful to me that this is what's going on in there. And um, as you said, what started me with all of this, well, we, you know, a lot of us have uh, someone we uh, are inspired by, and it's almost uh, eight years ago now. Uh, there's a woman in the market, Tova Martin. She's really a terrific plant person on the East Coast here. And she had written one of the first terrarium books just when the 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 craze or the, the interest has started. And I had been studying her work and I worked at the New York Botanical Garden for many years as their store manager and as their horticulturist there in the shop. And so we sold all these glass containers and I just started filling them with plants and we started selling them. And I started to, you know, change designs and experiment with different plant material myself. And after a while, I found my own design, found my own um, 
look than a style, let's say. So that's really how it all started. You know, it was a little taste on the market. And then I was in an environment where I could just, um, basically it was uh, heaven. You pick and choose what you wanted to do. So that's how I got started. And that, and it just went from there. Now, whenever we create a terrarium and we'll, we'll get into this a little deeper, is there a quote unquote right size for a terrarium or is there, is it, can it be any size? Well, it can be any size. Of course, the larger the terrarium, um, there is a different dynamic in planting. Uh, you can use different size plants. And then the smaller the terrarium, um, you, you know, you're going to be, uh, using minute, uh, little things and you may want to choose specific plants that would work better. Um, different plants grow, uh, different, uh, growth patterns. Uh, different speed of pattern, you know, growth. So you want to be a little choosy about what you're doing with the size that you have. And um, different uh, glass jars even, and I talk about this in my book, um, present themselves as uh, creating more or less moisture. Something about the shape, like a fishbowl or a straight-sided uh, cookie jar, and also the way the lids fit on are very important. The lids and the way they seal the glass jar is going to uh, dictate how much moisture is going on inside there. So um, maybe uh, more information than you wanted to know, but there you go. That's definitely okay. Now, um, is there is this something that anyone can do? Maybe if you feel you, ha- you don't have a green thumb, you're like, I've tried growing houseplants, I end up killing them. Would this be something that maybe is a little bit more successful for people like that? Sure. And, um, you know, uh, if a person doesn't have a green thumb and they need a little help with what to choose, uh, they can choose some uh, simple, easy plants, maybe one plant in a small container. And, you know, now there's the uh, air plant, those little uh, spiky looking air plants. Their botanical name is Tillandsia. And they're available even at the grocery store these days. That's a very easy plant to use. And you can put it in a glass uh, jar or bowl or anything, and it really just needs to be misted uh, with a, a plant mister, and, and that's it. So if you want to start with something like that, where you get your, your uh, sea legs there um, on how to do it, and um, that sort of thing, I think, sure, or one little plant in a, in a glass container, and I think that'll get you on the, on the, on the right path. So with that being said, what what are some other tips in which you can offer for best terrarium success? Uh, when we plant the life of the plants in there, we're obviously using some type of medium to grow that. I'm assuming that's a potting soil or a compost? Sure. Uh, a regular house plant soil is just fine. Um, you don't want anything that's going to remain too muddy. So, you know, uh, any sort of regular house plant soil is just fine. Um what I like to do, I have a couple of things that have shown to uh, give me a little advantage. So uh, to be successful with the terrarium, you should only water it, if you do at all, with a mister. And you put it on the squirt, like you turn it so it squirts a stream of water. And that is how you're going to water it, if you need to at all, because most closed terrariums will go several months without needing any water. Um, if it's open or the lid is a little loose and the air is kind of getting in and out, it may dry out a little uh, quicker. And so you would use the mister. Then when you're building the terrarium, um, I've discovered over the last few years uh, a new thing where I like to put a little layer of sand on the bottom and then put your pebbles on top because you're creating an area where any excess water can go down. And the sand is such a great catch-all. It's going to keep that extra water. It's going to absorb it, first of all, and it's going to keep it away from the plants so that they don't get too soggy or, or water, watery. So, and, and you can use um, colored sand even, which is decorative, and uh, that's kind of exciting in your design. Um, I water the plants before I plant them in the terrarium, and then you don't give them water again. So you know that, you, that you, they got a little wet in the soil in their little root ball, you plant them in there, and then you leave it for at least a week or so. Um, 
And again, if it's closed, it probably isn't going to need any water. So if you plant them and you think, oh, gosh, this I, it's so foggy in there, I can't even see, and there's water all over the inside of the glass, get a paper towel, wipe it out, leave the lid off for maybe a half an hour, and that will help bring back the balance of uh, the ecosystem inside. So those are a couple of really easy um, tips that are going to help you a great deal when you get started. Awesome. So we are talking with Maria Coletti. She is a, a terrarium expert and an author. So tell us about your book, Terrariums Under Glass. What can a reader expect to find and why should our listeners check it out? Yeah. Well, um, I really packed a lot of information in there. It was very thorough. And first of all, it's going to give you inspiration. You know, oh, I want to make a terrarium. I don't know where to start. What am I going to do? So there's a whole chapter on the designs that I have created and I put in there, the different styles that I have done and different plants I've used. And then, you know, the basics of how to step-by-step, what materials to use, what plants. And so you really have a complete picture from beginning to end. And then I added a couple of special projects at the end with moss and even a water terrarium and uh, some fun things that um, a little more, design oriented uh to decorate your home so it's very very complete um you're going to have everything you need and the pictures are great we we really um worked very hard to get all the different ideas in there so i think you're going to enjoy it very much so well with these terrariums i know people are thinking okay do i set it next to a window do i need direct light indirect light do i need to incorporate a grow light to keep these things going what and i guess it is also based on the type of plant in which you're putting in the terrarium yes and no um and like we were saying in the beginning terrariums are meant to be self-sustaining so we want to create one that we really don't have to care for at all and so several two things to answer your question you don't want to put it in direct sun or in the window because glass tends to magnify the sun and unless it's an open bowl with succulents or cactus that are going to really want to bake you you don't want your little tropical plants or your ferns or your your delicate little palms that are inside this terrarium to get too heated especially in the summertime um in most uh areas of the country i think it's very hot so that's one thing. So, but you want a, a, a lit room. Plants need light. So you can put it on a coffee table or a side table or a shelf, um, just so there's light in the room. And you definitely don't need a grow light. And one of the reasons you don't is because you want the plants to sort of slow down their growing process and be happy to be living in this little small glass house. And they kind of know they're in a little cramped place. It's, they don't grow. Uh, a great deal, but um, a grow light would enhance that. So we're not going to do that. We're going to just give them some regular light and they'll be fine. Great. So can I create a terrarium garden by repurposing objects from inside my home? Um, You sure do. And especially during this time period over the last few months, I've even been doing that. So um, old florist vases are very good. You know, you, you have all these vases that no longer have flowers in them and you put them in the closet or under the kitchen sink those are great Uh, sometimes they have straight sides to them and you can get your hand inside so they're easy to plant i have been uh, a project going Uh, i've been saving tomato sauce jars and uh, look at the companies that sometimes they use really terrific canning jars and they have atlas written on the side which is a brand or something like that and they're really quite uh, vintage looking So I've been collecting them over the last few months, and I actually was so excited because I went for a walk uh, to get some air, and I passed this little antique shop, and they had this wire basket, and I'm going to make this multi-glass, I mean, you don't have to do that, but I'm just saying you could really easily uh, get a wire basket or a regular basket and put your tomato sauce jars in there, you clean them out, and then you make a little terrarium in there. You get a plant. It could be even one little plant. And then you have a collection, and you could have a really cute windowsill design. So that's easy. Um, fish bowls are very good. Um, you can even use large drinking glasses. You know, uh, depends on whether you want something small or large. Um, 
people sometimes use cake plates with the lid. That's really fun project. So yeah, so go through your kitchen cabinets, and see what you've got available. Now, before we let you go and ask how people can get a hold of you, I want to clarify. I know people have these, you know, plastic pretzel tubs or cheese ball tubs. These have to be glass. You can't use plastic to create a terrarium, or can you? Well, it depends on how clear the plastic is. I suppose if you wanted to, I, I don't think it would harm the plants. Um, I don't usually. I find that the glass containers are more sturdy, and I, I have a few terrariums that have even lasted a few years. And even though the plants are outgrowing the container, um, you know, you have this sturdy container. So that, that might be an idea, but you could try plastic, and it doesn't have to last forever. If you last for a few months or um, and that, you know, starts to outgrow its container, you can make another one. Well, we greatly appreciate, Maria, the information you provided. How can listeners find you and get a hold of your great book? Well, I would love for them to do that. Um, if they're on social media, uh, I have an Instagram page, and it has a link to a web page that I've created. Um, I also have uh, email listed on both those areas. There is a Facebook page for the book, Terrariums, Gardens Under Glass. You can certainly grab me there. Um, and my um, email is listed on all these different areas. You're welcome to reach out and contact me. Um, my web page has the books on them, and they have a very uh, competitive uh, sale price. And there's also one or two other items. I've created a T-shirt with a beautiful terrarium design and a tote bag. So um, please do go over to the website and uh, see if one of those things um, – attracts your attention and uh, please reach out to me i always love to hear from people and uh and that's really the fun part well maria we thank you for your time you've offered holly and myself and all of our listeners and we we thank you very much for that that is terrific you guys have a great night you too thank, thank you. you and when we come back it's going to be all about your garden questions and our garden answers you're listening to the wisconsin vegetable gardener radio show Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Trimbin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. World's Coolest Rain Gauge.com. Need I say more? When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Drip Works, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, 
Harvest More. Blue Ribbon Organics. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. appreciate you hanging around for the program. If you got a question, we probably got an answer for you. You can get a hold of us by emailing us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also give us a call right now or anytime at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. That will put you in direct contact with us. If we can't get to your call, leave a message. We will call you back with the answer to your question. We had a number of questions come in this week, Holly, and uh, we'll see how many we can get through here. One is, uh, we'll start with this one. I have a small tomato patch and many of the tomatoes are cracking before I'm, before they're red. What is there I can do in order to prevent this? Thank you, Jim. Well, one is, there's a couple of reasons. One is that, um, it can be genetics of the particular variety. And then also cracking occurs when there's an inconvenience of moisture in the soil. So maybe there's too much water. The tomato will grow too rapidly faster than the skin like the inside of the tomato grows faster than the skin and that's when the the cracking occurs or if there's a dry spell that can cause a problem too all right uh let's see here a friend of mine has the blackening brown bottom of the tomato and it's ripe on the top what's going on and can you help me well this is blossom and root rot uh this occurs whenever the, there's been a inconsistency of moisture in the soil the soil is too dry, then it gets too wet, and then uh, the plant has already developed the fruit that's on the on the vine, and there's not enough calcium that's being released from the soil to be uptaken by the plant, and then the bottom of the tomato plant does not develop correctly. So it's not that we don't need to add Epsom salt. We don't need to add milk. We don't need to add Tums. We just need to water. 99% of the soils in all the gardens across the country just need to water in order to allow that 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 mineral to be able to be uptaken by the plant. If it's too dry, it locks it up in the soil and you can't get the plant can't uptake it. Then the plant is trying to develop a fruit with not enough of the elements or nutrients or minerals that it needs in order to do it correctly. So that's what's going on there. Water consistently. Water consistently, yes. Okay, so any idea why my Yukon Gold tomatoes have darkened, potatoes? Potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> Yukon Gold sure. tomato have a potato have a darkened, hollow center. This has happened the past several years. I am in southeast Wisconsin. Well, this can happen anywhere, not just southeast Wisconsin. This is called hollow heart. It occurs because of uneven moisture during the tuber development, and then you have this hollow point in a hollow dark area inside of the potato now it is edible you can cut around it and it's fine um but it sometimes it's called brown heart or sugar center it's uh found it's found in every it's found everywhere where potatoes are grown there's not a place where it's not it's just inconsistent watering uh that's the problem you got to have the moisture correct at the time of p- potato development uh, on that so that's what it is it's called hollow heart uh, also known as brown heart or sugar center uh, in potatoes. So keep that in mind that that's something that's going on in your potato patch. Let's see here. Can I let my plants uh, go to seed and let them drop the seeds and let them grow again where they're at, such as onions or lettuce or radishes? Thank you very much. Um, the you, 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 Yes you, and you, no. You can. You can. But there could be a problem. Radish is not a problem. They're going to seed. Lettuce, not a problem. It's going to seed. It's the onions or the leeks that you're going to have problems with because you got to get these things spaced out so the bulb uh, uh, develops correctly, and you got to have good soil, loose soil for the bulb to grow. So if you're, we've we've allowed lettuce seeds and radish seeds to go to seed, and they've dropped, and we have a lot of volunteers. That's what it is. I call it in the industry whenever these plants naturally come up from previous years' seed drop. 
volunteers uh, for plants such as onions or leeks where you need that proper spacing. You can let that occur. However, you have a much better success rate if you start them indoors uh, under grow lights and take care of them that way rather than, you know, because not all of them are going to seed just right or be buried under the soil just right. So certain plants it works well, other plants it does not. Uh, we got time for one more, Holly. I love your podcast, and I planted several kinds of pole beans. The purple ones have rust on them, bean rust, uh, but the neighboring beans do not seem to be affected in any way. Uh, is this common? How do I prevent this from happening again? How do I sanitize my seeds before planting, and how do I save the seeds? Okay, so you don't. You, this is this is not a seed problem, and I get I can kind of get where that question comes from. So you don't have to worry about sanitizing the seeds. You think you've got bad seeds yeah. just carrying that that yeah. disease? Yeah, that makes sense. But unfortunately, uh, rust, bean rust, is a an airborne fungus. If the spores travel through the air. And if your plants are planted close together, they're going to be more susceptible to that. So um, if you do have that bean rust, it is going to go through the air. Now, typically, when the, the bean rust occurs, it's near the end of the season right? for the beans. So, and typically, it hits everything. And so if you've got a variety that's not being affected and the adjacent kind is, save those seeds or know what you planted there and, and grow them again because they may be more resistant to that particular strain of right, rust. Right, right. So yeah, so that's the issue is it's a, it's an airborne disease. So what you want to do to prevent this from reoccurring is you want to pull those plants out and you want to trash them. Don't burn them, don't compost them, don't mulch with them, just trash them. Get rid of them. Yeah. And that will uh, help reduce the potential of infestation or infecting the garden come next year. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this show, did you? Well, you can revisit it in its entirety by going to the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we'll send you the link uh, of this show and past shows. So uh, until next week, uh, tune in next week when we'll be talking about buying in bulk, what you should and what you shouldn't do and how to store it, as well as Rob Greenfield will be with us, and your garden questions will get answered as always. So for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and until next week, we will see you in the garden. <laughs>